Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time and I'm here today for a fermenting this and that. This isn't a usual this and that video where I talk about all kinds of different things. This one is focused specifically on fermenting and some of the projects that I have going on. Now the purpose of this particular video is to not only just show you the projects I have going on but to give you some updates on some of the things I may be doing differently but also to direct you back to the videos where I show the basic how to make some of the various things I have going on as well. I mean, I can't talk about how to do all of those in one video or this video would probably be at least an hour and a half long. So let's start with a couple of the projects I have here and that is uh, my latest batch of kimchi. So if you didn't see my most recent kimchi making video, I'll go ahead and link to that one down below. And that one was just a little bit different than this one. Now what I did differently here was it might look like I have green onions in this one, but uh, since those green onions that I planted from that video have a little ways to go before I can harvest them, they did start growing like within two days. They were already getting new life and now they're already up to here. But I have lots of garlic greens and stalks and so what I did was I actually pulled a whole garlic stalk up leaving the cloves in the ground and then cut that up just like you would a green onion so leaves and everything so that is where I can get that darker green color in there and then um, I just use regular yellow onions that I purchased from the store so the next project I started was some uh, eggs from our chickens. So of course we're getting lots of eggs. I've been selling a bunch, giving some to our kids, but still have, even with just 10 chickens, still have way more eggs than we can use up. And I have plenty put up in the freezer from the year before when I was getting tons. And then I only had seven chickens laying. Now I have 10. The color from this is coming from a couple of different sources. And one is the peppers I use. So I've got, these were actually still, I. I didn't realize I still had some left. Ellen Fisher had sent me some dry jalapeno peppers from her garden, a big jar like this size of them, and it's been taking me a long time to work through. I added those in here, and I also added some dehydrated garlic slices to this. Now, I have a basic instruction video on how to do just the simple, uh, not adding any spices really other than salt fermenting eggs that I will link to down below, but it's very simple. You can watch it if you want. But really, it's just a matter of using the fermentation starter, some salt, and some water, and of course the hard boiled eggs. So I'll be talking more about the for fermentation starter in a bit. I also have a video on how to make one, how to refresh it, and on and on and on. It's actually pretty in depth. I have a simple one that's just how to make it, but I do recommend you go watch the more in depth one, which I'll post down below. I'll also be getting some new stuff started today because I'm going to be doing some experiments like I always like to do. So anyway, uh, part of the reason this is so dark in color is because of the, the starter that I used in this was a berry starter. So I added a lot of red, but it is now changed to more of an orange because of the peppers in there. And here's what you can expect. I'm gonna put a picture right here. This is how the batch looked when I first started it. So looking at that and comparing it to how this looks now, you'll see this looks a lot more cloudy. That is what your ferments are supposed to do. That is totally normal. Now I'm also going to insert a picture of a batch I did last year or the year before of basically the same recipe right here, but I used a different fermentation starter that didn't have as much color to it so you can see how clear it looked when it started. Now by the time it was done, it looked very much like this. Anyway, I love fermented hard boiled eggs and it's just one of those ways that I can put them up and yes, I do put them in the refrigerator once I get them to where I want them. They're very fizzy and bubbly right now. They have that smell like makes me think they're about done, but I'm going to give them at least one more day and then let those flavors really infuse well into the eggs themselves. Now, a couple of pointers I wanted to say about that. Um, I don't 
think I covered in that video was I had people giving different ideas on what to do to get more flavor into the eggs because I've done different types. I've done some with rosemary. One of my favorites, believe it or not, was the one where I had made some beet kvass and then took some of the beet kvass and fermented the eggs with that instead of using the starter itself. Though the starter was used to make the beet kvass in the first place, I then used some of that beet kvass and made some eggs and the color was beautiful this is what they look like right here after I they were done and I cut them open and man they had a great flavor so if you like beet kvass or beets at all you would really like this and the color I think is just beautiful but anyway some some of the things I, I just felt like the flavor didn't infuse as much into the eggs as I would have liked so a couple people gave the suggestion of taking like a toothpick or something else and poking the egg through the white into the yolk and then somebody else said, no, don't do that because the yolk will soften and ooze out. And I decided to go ahead and give it a try. And honestly, I didn't find that it really increased the flavor anymore. And the person that made the comment of the egg yolk leaking out, yes, it does do that. Even if it's a very hard boiled egg, that liquid gets in there and softens up that egg yolk and then it starts to ooze out the holes. And I thought it was a little bit gross. Now, you can still experiment with it, like do a small jar. I always say, don't just listen to what one person says. That's why I went ahead and tried it, even though I had two opinions. I decided to try it for myself. So I still recommend trying it for yourself. You might like that softer egg yolk, and that might not bother you. And, but I say always do it with something small, like a small little jar here. I'm gonna talk about in a moment why this is such a small jar that I've got. Uh, obviously this would probably only have room for one maybe two eggs if you squished them in there tight but that is a good way to start usually when I did my experiments I used a pint jar so I could put about four or five eggs in there and all of them turned out good it's just the flavor of all of them wasn't as uh, intense as I hoped it would be like that I think it was a rosemary garlic uh, it was good just would have loved to have more of that rosemary flavor in the eggs. Now, when I'm fermenting my goods, no matter what it is, once it gets to the point that it's where I want it, yes, I do store it in the fridge. Now, technically, this should be good on a shelf, but I wouldn't leave it, especially the eggs. I have no idea how long the shelf life would be if you left them out in a non-cold storage area. I think all fermented foods should be stored in some sort of cold storage. Not in a freezer, obviously, but at least a refrigerator or a root cellar or something like that. And like I said in the last kimchi making video I did, when I made my kimchi the old fashioned way, it did all its fermenting in the fridge and out on the counter. What I find out with kimchi, and this is why I prefer doing it in small jars rather than big jars like I've tried before, is that once you start working through it you really want to work through it quickly because the flavor of it changes once you've opened up the jar and started getting into it there's something about it that it just isn't as good if you uh if you don't work through that jar right away now an unopened jar other than maybe burping it now and then it will keep that good flavor until you open it and start eating it. I think once it's got airspace in there, that's what changes the flavor. So maybe even if you don't, if you're not going to work through a fermented vegetable, especially or a fermented anything uh, quickly enough, you might even want to choose pint sized jars rather than quarts. For the kimchi, quarts are perfect for me. I work through them with them in the perfect amount of time just before that flavor starts changing. I would say I eat about a cup a day, which is a quarter of a quart jar. So four days I can have a jar finished up easily enough and and it's spicy and it's fizzy and it's so good that oh that's the other thing is once you start working through that jar that fizziness goes away within a few days and so you just it I don't know it just detracts from the overall experience of a good kimchi when you don't have that fizziness anymore and then another project you, you've heard me talk about in recent uh this and that videos and that is the banana vinegar so this is the one I decided I liked the way my quart jar uh, banana vinegar turned out so well that I decided to go ahead and make a half gallon jar the color is definitely turning out much darker but it still has a great banana smell to it it's still very 
it's still very fizzy and I think it's going to make just as good a vinegar as the other one even if the color turns out darker and that's with me pushing that banana peel down in there every day that's the important thing now when I first started making vinegar I would just put it in there and forget about it for a month I tried various different ways of weighing it down that didn't cost an arm and a leg like those really expensive glass weights but the issue I have with the glass weights is not only the price, it prevents as much oxygen getting down into the things that are fermenting as I think it really needs. So remember, when you're making vinegar, it needs oxygen for it to turn to a good vinegar. And this is another reason why stirring it daily, at least for the first couple of weeks, is a good idea because it helps aerate it some to kind of work more oxygen in there. Plus you're pushing that fruit back down, stirring everything up so that it, it, just, for, it just gets a real nice ferment. And with the banana peel, the banana peel must have a lot of sugar in it already. It doesn't seem to be that you need to add as much sugar to it to get a good uh, quality vinegar out of it. But then when you're talking about your other ferments, like you're making your sodas and your veg fermenting your vegetables, your eggs, I find it best to keep a tight-fitting lid that you just burp on occasion to allow those gases to escape but you're not trying to make wine here, but you're also not necessarily trying to make vinegar. I find that by doing that, my kimchi will still take on a nice tart flavor, but it also doesn't turn to vinegar that way. But of course it doesn't have as much sugar to turn into vinegar anyway. It just takes on a tart flavor that I wouldn't call vinegar. And then back here, as you might have seen my mead making video, my two batches of mead I currently have going is the mango pineapple and the raspberry. Both of those were made with some old honey stock that I'm trying to work through, plus some freeze-dried fruits I decided to try. I have, That was my first time using freeze-dried rather than fresh fruits in making a flavored mead. And uh, the, they smell wonderful. I've checked them and they're coming along quite nicely. I think these will make excellent meads. We'll find out in a few more weeks when these are completely done though, and I'll be doing an update on that, most likely in this and that video. So anyway, the wine, whenever you're making wine, or uh, in this case mead, which is also known as honey wine, you have to have an airlock. You wanna prevent oxygen from getting into that because preventing the oxygen causes it to turn into wine and stay wine, but allowing oxygen in there uh, will turn it to vinegar. So that's why there's the two different methods. And that's why if you're making vinegar, you don't put an airlock on it or you'll just get wine. If you're making wine, you do put an airlock on it so that the gases escape, but you prevent oxygen exposure from turning it into vinegar. All right, so now let's talk a bit about the fermentation starter, mostly because I'm going to be uh, changing up my fermentation starter a little bit and starting a new one as an experiment. So here is my berry one. Now, every time I make something with it, the color of it lightens because when I, I go to refresh it, I don't always keep adding new fruit. And so I'm just adding more water and sugar. That's all. But after I started this batch, I decided I want to go, even though I really like the way these particular berries, this is blackberries and raspberries, uh, both a combination of frozen blackberries that we had picked in the wild and some freeze dried raspberries. Uh, even though it makes a really great starter, very fizzy, very lively, I've decided I want to go back to having something that has more of a neutral flavor and color. Raisins are really good for that. Uh, they, it does kind of make a little bit of a brownish color. It can be kind of dark, but it's neutral enough that it will look fine in whatever you use it in. And the flavor is very neutral. But today I'm going to do something different. So the first thing I want to do is I want to strain the fruit out of this. So I've got my measuring cup here with a strainer over it. This is stainless steel. That's why I'm not worried about it. the metal on it. If it's not a stainless steel strainer, then you should go with a nylon strainer whenever you're working with ferments. Stainless steel is cool because it's non-reactive. It won't have any effect on your ferment. Okay, so I'm just going to strain it out. And what you'll notice is that the color of the berries has all faded and they've disintegrated quite a bit. There's really no whole berries left in there anymore. So all the color 
you will find this is totally normal. This will happen with raisins, blueberries, no matter what it is you use. The color will go into the liquid and not very much will stay in the fruit. And this is another reason why I like to change it out every so often because what that tells me is a lot of the goodness of the fruit is now gone out of the actual fruit itself. It's like making any kind of infusion. When you're infusing uh, different herbs and stuff into oils or teas, that's getting drawn out of the, the whole herb and into the liquid. There's not gonna be very much nutrients or other benefits in that. So then you just toss it and let it com compost. There'll be some, obviously, but, and of course you'll have your fiber and stuff like that. So this will just get tossed out to the chickens. They, they love the fruit from my various uh, fermentation starters. It's not like you can't use it in something else, but I find there's really very little flavor in it and a, I've tried doing other stuff with it, even the raisins. It seems like they'd be really good, but no. So it's just better to throw them out to the chickens because it's really healthy for them anyway. Okay, so I decided to go ahead and uh, clean the jar up a little bit because it was looking a little crusty around the top edge. And even though this is pretty lively and I'm not using it, I'm going to go ahead and throw in just a tad bit of sugar just to feed it because it's been a few days since I've used it. Well, no, let me not put any water in there yet. I'm gonna throw in, because I like the very neutral color of these, I'm gonna throw in some mango. This is freeze-dried. Fresh fruit, dehydrated fruit, freeze-dried fruit. Sometimes frozen fruits don't work as well, but I think if you combine them with something that's either fresh, freeze-dried, or dehydrated will work really well. But I've experimented with all kinds and they all do good for fermenting. Oh, pineapple, by the way, freeze-dried pineapple. So this is the pineapple and mangoes I get from Mother Earth Products. And I'll take my little vinegar spoon here because it's not gonna hurt anything and just kind of stir that down in there. Yeah, I don't need very much and I'll probably add more eventually as I need it. Now I'm gonna go ahead and top it off with water. And as you can see, I've been making, going back, because now I'm at that time of the year where I like to ferment a lot, and then making the, uh, the wines, the meads and stuff, that needs a whole cup at least of starter in each gallon. So I want to have bigger amounts of fermentation starter ready to go. And so that's why I've decided to go with back to the quartz, which is what I always used to have. Now for this one, this is gonna be my experiment because I've been telling people, yes, you can use herbs, you can use vegetables, you can use uh, fruit to make a fermentation starter. Yet, I haven't tried doing one with herbs at all yet. And again, wanting to stick with things that have a neutral-ish color and flavor, I decided to go with some dandelion flowers and some red clover. And so this is gonna be my experiment using herbs to make a fermentation starter. I'm confident it's gonna work, but I, hadn't I haven't tried it yet. So I need to do that so I can definitely say from experience, yes, it can be done. So all I'm gonna do is just go ahead and add, it's just gonna be a small amount, so maybe about a teaspoon of sugar to that. And when I used to do this, when I used to start these, I always started them in smaller batches, like a teaspoon of sugar and a little bit of water, and then the next day more sugar, more water. Now I just go ahead and put the water in there as full as I want it, not too full, because I'm gonna to need to feed it periodically. Let's go ahead and stir that up, get that sugar dissolving in there. And you can also shake it. That's, all, that's something I, I don't always think to say, like when I'm fermenting kimchi. Like this one, I didn't keep it shaken up well enough. And you can see most of the peppers down in here. And it's colored all the cabbage down here, but not up here. But I do say uh, shake it. Not too hard. Don't shake it too hard, especially once it's fizzy. This is about ready to go in the refrigerator. This is actually a better way to do it here. And then after it sits for about a minute, then go ahead and release all those gases that are gonna build up because you just uh, shook it up like a, like a pop can. And by the way, one of the kimchi is one of the three that I started in that video. Um, when I went to open it, I, had, I didn't keep it burped well enough. So I, when I went to open it, when it was ready, it uh, almost exploded. It just went psh and bubbled out all over my counter. And that's totally cool with me. It's like, well, I know it's ready. So anyway, uh, even with your starter, I find it's a good idea to kind of swirl it around every so often or turn it back and forth, keep that sugar mixed in, and just keep some good activity going on in there. 
So that's what it looks like. So in about three days, this should be good and bubbly and I should have a nice fermentation starter made with this. And then the other thing I was gonna say is if I'm real happy with my results on this and how well it ferments, um, I will be making a bigger batch. So I'll probably have two because right now this is the only one I have going. I usually like to have two fermentation starters in my fridge at the same time. And the, here's the reason why is because maybe one day I'm, I decide I'm gonna start some kimchi. So I make the kimchi, I feed the starter, I top it off, and maybe later in the day I say, oh, I wanted to start another batch of uh, fermented eggs or another batch of mead, I forgot. Well, I don't like using this, that same starter right away. I like to wait at least 24 hours because I just fed it, I just added more water to it, and that needs time to build up its activity level again. And so having a second starter on hand, I can leave this one, let it finish its process through the day, pull out my other one and use that. It's just important that if you have more than one at a time, I've had like three or four at a time because I'm always experimenting, you want to make sure you keep cycling through them. Keep using, don't use the same one every time. Keep using different ones so that uh, each time you use it, it's getting refreshed, it's, it's getting fed again, and, that's, and then you can also check it at that point and say, well, this looks like it could use some more herbs or some more fruit or whatever it is that you're using in there. And that just kind of keeps you on top of it that way. Now, when I first was making the fermentation starter and using it for various things, I used to actually store it on top of my fridge to keep it lively. But here was the problem with that. If uh, you have to feed it every day, every day, if you're gonna leave it in a warm area. But if you put it in your fridge, after it's nice and bubbly the way you want it, and very active, store it in your fridge, you'll only have to feed it at most once a week. I've had some go as long as a month and still be good. That was kind of, kind of sluggish and slow, but I could pull it out, feed it, let it sit at room temperature for 24 hours, and then got it active and lively again. Leaving it too long, it will starve and it will die, and then it will just turn to vinegar and it won't be good for using as a ferment starter. Oh, and here's another thing I've never tried, but you could try if you want, is using your fermentation starter to get your vinegars going. Because basically, just like with the wine, the idea is the same. I'm not using any fermentation starter when I make vinegar, and yet it gets, within three days, it's bubbly, just like a fermentation starter. So really, the starter itself, as I say in that video, it's more of kind of insurance that you're gonna get a good ferment going, but it's not really necessary as long as you have lively bacteria and yeast already on the fruits, herbs, and so on that you're using. So I'm not you adding a fermentation starter to this to get it going. I never do, <laughs> and yet it makes its own. But again, I always prefer using them, especially something like my kimchi, my wine, anything else. It's gonna speed up the activity, make sure it gets going, and ensure that it will ferment and it's got everything in there that it needs to get going. Oh, and one more thing. I, I forgot to say this in my kimchi making video, though I did show pictures is you can make kimchi out of just about anything. It doesn't have to be Napa cabbage or bok choy or even just regular green or red cabbage. It can be anything. I've made kimchi out of nasturtium flowers and leaves and let me tell you that was really good. Since nasturtium already has that kind of radishy flavor to it, it's actually perfect. So if you have nasturtiums growing like crazy, use both the leaves and the flowers. Stems too. Throw some of those seeds in there. They're nice and spicy hot and it makes a great kimchi. I've also made kimchi using calendula flowers and it was really good. I was probably one of my favorites. So don't get yourself stuck in a rut. You know, think outside the box when it comes to doing any of this stuff. Okay, well I hope you enjoyed my fermenting this and that video and be watching for more updates on various fermenting projects through the summer because that's when I do most of it. Okay, well thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.